Hey, what's up everybody? How's everybody doing today? I hope uh, today is a great day for everybody. It was beautiful weather here today. The weather here in North Carolina has been nice and cool and, and pleasant at night. It's down into about the uh, mid to low 40s, but that's not too bad. And even out here in the tent, it's, it's not too horrible. So uh, if you're just joining us, we are getting into John chapter 3. Uh, we've spent the last uh, several weeks going through the book of John. Uh, we see in the book of John, uh, we see it starts off with the, uh, the baptisms by John the Baptist. We see the baptism of Christ. Uh, we see the, the wedding. Uh, and, and we see a few other things. We see Jesus cleansing the temple. Um, and then here we are in John 3, verses 1 through 3, in a title I have uh, called Born to Reign. Uh, now, some of you may understand the, the title Born to Reign. It was a title that Will Smith had used in, uh, I believe it was his third or fourth album, uh, as Will Smith Alone and not uh, Will Smith and Jazzy Jeff. Uh, but here we are, John 3, verses 1 through 3. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So it starts off right here, a Pharisee named Nicodemus. Well, who is this uh, Pharisee named Nicodemus? So at the time, uh, you had the uh, the Pharisees and you had the, the Sanhedrin um, and you had the Sadducees. Well, think about it this way. The, the Pharisees and the Sadducees are really no different than what we have today. You've got the liberals and you've got the conservatives. Uh, and the Sanhedrin is a central body that is made up of the senators of the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin, and they make up the Senate. Uh, they are the ruling body over uh, the Jewish people. Uh, although ruling body is a relative term, they are the ruling religious body, uh, as at the time the Jews were still under the control of Rome. So who is Nicodemus? Nicodemus was a Pharisee's ruler. Uh, it is likely, um, I, I believe that we've, we've seen that uh, he is likely to be on the council of the Sanhedrin, a senator. Um, so this tells us a few things. One, uh, Jesus is teaching is being noticed. It's not just being noticed by the little peons on the ground, but it's being noticed by the educated, the, the uh, educated elite of the time. So Nicodemus comes to uh, Jesus, and there's a couple things in verse 2 uh, that, uh, that is important. First of all, we see that it says, uh, the man came to Jesus by night. Well, as you and I both know, most things that you want to keep secret happens at night. Why do most burglaries and, and home invasions and stuff like that happen at night? Why? Because the creepy crawlies go bump in the night. It's easier to get around without being noticed. And it is likely that Nicodemus wanted to have a private conversation with Jesus because there was something about Jesus that he saw that intrigued him, and he didn't want to be interrupted by the other members of the council. He wanted to be able to talk to Jesus one-on-one, -on -one, and of course, the really the only way to do this is to be able to do it at night. Now, this is going to come at great personal risk for Nicodemus. If Nicodemus would have been seen during the day uh, consulting with, with Jesus, it is possible that there could have been ramifications against him by the other members of the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, or the Sadducees. So, of course, 
he wants to be able to have this private conversation. Now, he goes and, and he says something that is, is very important. He addresses Jesus not as some crazy guy, not as some heretic. Uh, he addresses him uh, in a matter of utmost respect. He addressed him as rabbi. And rabbi is uh, a preacher, a teacher, uh, someone of importance, and most importantly, someone who speaks with some kind of authority. So we see here, he says, we know, he doesn't say we think, he says, we know you are a teacher come from God. So you see Nicodemus, he's, he right off the bat is saying, hey, we understand what you've been doing. We see what you're, what you've been doing. And, and he says, no one can do these signs unless God is with him. So he's calling Jesus an authoritative teacher. They cannot disprove or deny anything that Jesus has said to them. Everything he has said has been true. It's been accurate. And, and Jesus never uh, never answers in the way we think he's going to answer, but he always answers straight to the point, straight to the heart. Um, and he knows what's on their hearts. So he answers not necessarily what they are saying, but he answers what they are feeling, what they are thinking uh, deep in their heart. So that way, one, they know that they're being convicted by his by his teachings, because he knows what they're thinking. He knows what they're feeling. He's God. So he bypasses the, the minutia of uh, unnecessary conversations. So Nicodemus is here, and he's saying, we understand that, that you are someone from God. Now, he's not saying we are absolutely in agreement that you are the, the son of God, the, the prophecy, the Messiah. We're not saying that, but we understand that you are from God. So in some way, shape or form, uh, that authority comes with the view of the Sanhedrin and even Nicodemus, a limited view of authority, not total authority yet. So uh, Nicodemus risked a lot by, by coming here. Uh, we don't know exactly what would have happened to Nicodemus if the rest of the council would have found out that he is uh, consorting with this instigator uh, as they view Jesus. Um, we understand that Nicodemus is giving him a notable high praise. Um, we, we understand that they see the, the miracles, the signs that have been there, and... Uh, the big question is, going into verse 3, Jesus answered him and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So that's an interesting answer to what Nicodemus had said, because, well, Nicodemus didn't actually say anything about seeing the kingdom of God. So... We see Christ, again, answering in a way that doesn't really make sense on the surface. But when you start diving down into it, it makes perfect sense. Because the question was truly being asked, who is this man and is he who he claims to be? And Jesus answers to him and says, unless you are born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So that leads to the big question of the verses, what does it mean to be born again? Well, talks, uh, Paul talks about being reborn in 2 Corinthians 15, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if anybody believes in Christ and uh, submits themselves to Christ and allow Christ into their heart, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. 
So what Jesus is really saying is, one, in order to seek the kingdom of God, in order to be uh, able to enter the kingdom of God, one has to do something fairly significant. And that is, as Jesus says, no one gets to the Father except through me. So in order for us to get to the Father, right, we have to go through the heart of Christ. So as Christ says, uh, all are welcome, but few will enter. All are welcome. His Christ, uh, Christ dies with his hands open wide, accepting everybody to him. The problem is in order to get past him, in order to get through Christ to the Father, you have to go through the heart. As we know, uh, we are a sinful sot. We are a sinful creation. We live in sin. We breed in sin. And unless we find salvation in Christ alone, we die in sin. In fact, scripture is so clear about that point that it doesn't say that we are drowning in sin, that we are in essence dead in our sin. Without Christ, we're dead. There's nothing. We may walk around and do stuff, but spiritually, our souls are dead. D-E-D, -E -D, dead. Nothing of any good at all comes from our soul. We could be the good guy, but if we don't know Christ, we are dead in our sins, meaning there is no hope for our eternal salvation for those who don't know Christ. And it says that anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. What does that mean? It means that we have to, with malice, and scripture says, with malice, we have to kill off, we have to destroy, we have to hate our sin. We have to get to a point where the sin, the sinful nature that we have in our lives that we hate it so much that we turn away from that sin every day. The truth is, Jesus was born to reign. He was born to live a life with us, to live a full happiness and sorrowful and joyful and, and even a little bit angry life with us. He shows us the, the range of emotions right he's angry when he sees his father's house and yet he does when he sees his house uh taken over by the money changers who are just gouging everybody and in it for a profit not really there to to truly help people uh we see sadness when he raises uh before he raises nicodemus uh we see happiness as he's uh with friends we see uh, I'm, I'm sure he was hurt uh, as much as he knew it was coming uh, when Judas kisses him in the the Garden of Gethsemane. I am sure that that he felt the sting of betrayal because he was still man. And even though he knew what was in Ju uh, Judas's heart, even though he prophesied that Judas was going to betray him, knowing it and feeling it are very different. And I am sure he felt it. So Christ was born to be here, to show us what we could be, what we can be, what we need, we strive to be. But only through him can we actually wash that mud away. So there is a an idea that we are born in what is called total depravity. We live a life of total depravity. And and a friend of mine was, was telling me that think about total depravity as being covered in mud. And and we go up and I go up to, uh, to Jim Bob Joe and say, hey man, you got some mud on you. Let me help you get that off. And I'm covered in mud and he's covered in mud and I'm trying to help him get that mud off. And really what it's doing is this just creating a mud mess everywhere? Everything I touch, everything I step on is getting covered in mud, and it's just spreading his mud around. 
It's just moving his mud around. It's moving its his sin around to other areas. It's not really cleaning him in any way. It's not helping me in any way because we cannot get the mud off. Now, total depravity uh, through the Calvinist doctrine, uh, human nature is thoroughly corrupt and sinful as a result of the fall. I don't think anybody would truly deny that. If anybody actually opens their Bible, opens scripture, uh, there's no way that you're going to actually be able to deny that we are sinful. You don't need to teach a, a two and a half, three year old how to lie. We don't need to teach anybody how to be sinful. We are very good at figuring that out all by ourselves, right? Uh, I was watching Bill Cosby a while back and uh, he leaves the room and he comes back and there's his, his child and his, he told the child early before he left, you can't have any cookies. And he comes back and the child has cookies and he goes, didn't I tell you that you couldn't have any cookies? He's, but I got it for you. No, you didn't. You got it for yourself, and now you're lying about it. So you did what you, you broke the rules, and then you lied about it. You don't need to teach little people how to lie. You don't need to teach adults how to lie, or how to steal, or selfishness, right? We have to teach kids how to share their toys, not how to keep their toys to themselves. So we are teaching the opposite of sin. Why? Because the sin is already in us. We are born with us. And and I love the song uh, Hard Love by Need to Breathe. Uh, it takes time uh, to build your spirit. And it, it says... Uh, well, what does it say? Need to breathe hard love lyrics right here. Boom. Uh, where is it? I don't know. Where is it? Okay. Um... I don't know. It's in here somewhere. You can't change without a fallout. It's going to hurt, but don't slow you down. Get back up because it's a hard love. Hold on tight a little longer. What don't kill you makes you stronger. Uh... Oh, here it is. A part of you has got to die to change. Isn't that accurate, though? Really, when we think about it, being born again is literally the process of pushing off, killing off our old selves, and and we see this in uh, we see this in baptism. There's nothing special in the water in baptism, but what we do see is uh, we see the the physical uh, showing of our faith, physical showing of our change, where we will go in dirty and we will come out cleaned and renewed. Now, does baptism mean that you are never going to get dirty again? No, it doesn't. Does baptism mean that you you dunk, you come up, and, and you're clean, and then a couple years later, you got to baptize again to clean again? No, that's not what that means. Baptism is a physical uh, profession of faith for others to see. We are in a process of sanctification every day. We are in a process of changing every day. Every day we should be getting up in the morning and we should be diving into scripture in our prayer life. Every day what we should be doing, what we should be saying, everything needs to be 
to keep us on a particular trajectory. Okay, that trajectory that we need to stay on is Christ alone. We are saved by faith through Christ. And that's really what it comes down to. The only authority on our salvation is scripture. And in order for us to live a born again life, in order for us to stay on the straight and narrow, is we've got to be one with Christ. Christ lived and died for us. And that's the gospel, friends. That is the gospel. We are only able to enjoy this life with pure joy, true joy, because we find our joy in Jesus. We don't find our joy in stuff. We don't find our joy in jobs. We don't find our joy in people. We don't find our joy in drugs or alcohol or sex. Those things may feel good in the moment, but they leave us hollow in the end. I read a book that most of the time when we are searching for something, when, when we are searching so deeply that we turn to all of these bad things, all of these substances and, and drugs and idols and everything that we, we turn to, we are looking to fill a cross-shaped hole in our heart. And the only way for us to fill and feel fulfilled in our lives is Jesus. And the only way to do that, the only way to truly find the joy in our lives is to succumb, is to accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Fill that void in our hearts and crush the old self and be born again, a new creation in Christ. We cannot ever do enough good. We cannot ever do enough works. When someone says, well, I'm basically a good person. I've never killed anybody. You're still covered in mud. And being covered in mud, being covered in mud, we cannot enter into the gates of heaven while we still have mud on us. And the only way to be completely and totally cleaned of that mud is to allow Jesus to clean us. Jesus is the OxyClean. He's the only one that can make us white as snow and get rid of all of our sins because he is the one that died to pay for our sins and he is the one that bore the wrath of God for us willingly willingly because he loved us so much so what does it mean to be born again? It means to cleave off your old self, to kill off the old sinful self within you and move forward into and with Jesus and let Jesus be the way, the truth, and the life. I hope everybody has a great week. Mothers out there, happy Mother's Day. Enjoy Mother's Day. We couldn't get through life without our mamas, uh, considering they're the ones that give birth to us. So whether you have uh, a birth mom, whether you have an adopted mom, whether your mom has moved on to the next life, regardless, 
whatever, wherever your mom is, give thanks to your mom. Not all moms are great. Not all moms are, are perfect moms. Some are pretty horrible. But either way, you're here because you had a mom. If Mother's Day is hard for you because your mom is not here anymore, I am personally saying a prayer for all of you out there who have lost your moms. I know that it's got to be hard. And understanding that Jesus lost his earthly dad pretty young, probably in his mid-teens, your Savior understands Go to Jesus with your pain. Go to Jesus with what is on your heart. But I'm praying for you. I hope everybody has a great Mother's Day. I hope everybody has a great week. And I look forward to seeing and hearing from all of you in the comment section below. If you liked it, hit a subscribe, uh, hit share, whatever. Let's get this out there. Let's see how far around the world we can get this thing to go. All right? Love y'all. Peace.